The ability to access the knowledge of the universe is much easier for us to access than we may believe. Brad Johnson, Conscious Matrix Communicator, is one of these unique individuals who is able to access a strong connection to the universal mind. Through his connection, Brad has assisted thousands of clients from all over the world through natural intuitive assistance. The intuitive information received is vast, covering a wide range of subjects. Brad's innate ability includes being able to access one's own universal matrix to help them realize their potential to create a life of profound greatness. One-on-one -on -one private sessions with Brad Johnson are available to anyone from around the world. Brad is also a proficiently trained psychic, Akashic Records reader, an online spiritual teacher, founder of his own unique and powerful healing system, Body Regeneration Healing, as well as a professional conscious channeler in communication with his own higher self-consciousness known as Adronis. For more information or to book a service appointment with Brad Johnson, visit his website at www.consciousmatrix.com. That's www.consciousmatrix.com. <laughs> You're a pumpkin. I'm a pumpkin, a big orange pumpkin. A big orange pumpkin. And when you, were there a lot of children out there? Not so much. No? Did you get a lot of candy? Yeah, I got a lot of candy. Mommy's eating all the chocolate bars. Well, tell Mommy that's your candy, honey. Okay. Tell her. Stop eating all my chocolate bars, Mommy. Get it sick. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. All Hit Radio. To the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome back to the X Zone, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell. We're coming to you live and around the world from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the Starcom Radio Network and and the Exxon Broadcast Network. Worldwide, toll-free, 800-610-7035. My email address is exxon at exxonradiotv.com. On all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV, and our main website where you can listen to the live broadcast of the Exxon Radio Show Monday through Friday from 8 p.m. until midnight, or off those hours, you can listen to the best of and we have shows going back right to 2002 at www.exoneradiotv.com. Exonation, my guest this hour is Colleen Morrow. And uh, Colleen was the founder and editor in chief of Intuition Magazine. And Intuition explored the higher potential of mind and many, and the many and varied ways of knowing intuition, inspiration, and telepathy, providing both research and how-to information in easy-read form for the general reader. Now, she's been a lifelong, she's been, uh, she's had a lifelong interest in uh, the untapped powers of the mind. Her website is www.spiritualtelepathy.net. And tonight we're talking to Colleen about soul consciousness for the global age. And joining me now is Colleen Morrow. And Colleen, welcome to the X Zone. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure, ma'am. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what led you on your road to to writing about soul consciousness, as well as being the editor in chief and founder of Intuition Magazine. Well, I was always interested in spiritual life and intuitive studies, mm -hmm. and I had an interesting experience that led to the founding of Intuition Magazine. Would you like to hear it? Please. Hello? 
Colleen, are you there? I've been in Alternative Magazine Publishing for several years. Right. I was between jobs mm-hmm. and looking for a new job. I was living in San Francisco, which at that time wasn't a place to pursue a career in magazine publishing. I had run the West Coast offices for several East Coast magazines, and I considered myself very lucky at that point to have gotten these jobs, but it, it felt like my luck was running out because there was nothing on the horizon. I was driving myself crazy, worrying about money, and uh, wondering if I was ever going to be employed again. And one morning I woke up and decided that I needed to take a break, that I would treat myself to one worry-free day outside working in my backyard garden. And I was standing in the garden when a thought suddenly flashed through my mind, and the thought was the Center for Applied Intuition. And this wasn't the familiar type of intuitive experience. I had always accessed intuitive information through feelings or... um, body-based sensations, mm-hmm. like a queasy stem- stomach. Sure. This was a purely mental experience. It felt like the words just dropped into my brain, and it didn't make any sense. I knew about the center and had met Bill Couts, the founder, but I couldn't imagine why I would go there to look for a magazine job. But I t- thought about it for a few days and thought, well, what the heck? I called him, asked him to send me information about the center, and a few days later, a large manila envelope arrived, and when I dumped it out, there were several brochures and a typewritten journal called Applied Sci. And this was the quarterly publication that Bill sent to the center's 200 members. It was about intuition and creativity. And as I flipped through the pages, I suddenly had an idea that this could be a real magazine if it was reformatted and renamed. I found it just fascinating. And I thought the subject would appeal to a much wider audience than this small uh, group of members. So I called Bill, made an appointment, went over to speak with him, and it turns out he had always dreamed of turning Applied Sci into a real magazine, but the right person had never come along. Went home, banged out a proposal, and came back the next day, and Intuition, a magazine for the higher potential of the mind, was born. Wow. And he had only a two-room suite, Mm -hmm. and so from the start, it was my magazine. I set up a shop at my dining room table, and I begged my writer friends to contribute free articles. I sold advertising space to pay for the printing, and set up a local bookstore distribution. I trucked them around in my car. And the copies all sold out within a week, so I knew my hunch had been right. And I then set up a national newsstand distribution network and started work on the second issue. And then Bill, about that time, decided to close the center, and he signed the rights to the magazine over to me. And I later received a grant and set up an office and hired a staff. And when I think about it now, there's several remarkable things about this story. One is I never could have gotten there through my rational mind. I had always dreamed of starting a magazine, but I Mm -hmm. couldn't have imagined that it would happen at that point. And two, I couldn't have seen that in the next decade there would be a flood of information on the subject of intuition, and the magazine really provided a focal point. So I was just sort of putting one foot in front of the other and following my guidance, and it just started a wonderful train of events. Super. Tell us about your book, uh, Spiritual Telepathy. Well, I was introduced to this subject by a friend and colleague, and once I started reading about it, I realized that this was the more advanced level of the, of the intuition work that I had done. Spiritual telepathy is communication from the subtle worlds. When we practice this type of telepathy, we have the ability to be in direct communication with our souls. And at this level, the information is always telepathic. We don't audibly hear the information. The information is simply dropped into our brains in the same way it was in that story. Mm-hmm. And um, it really is a higher correspondence of our personal intuition. Our personal intuition provides guidance about our day-to-day lives, but the soul knows our higher purpose and can help us understand the bigger picture. It's our most highest and most reliable source of direction and guidance. It's a much higher quality of information. Wow. So what is the main premise of spiritual telepathy? What will, what will, uh, what will readers learn Well, I show readers that there are three types of telepathy. There's instinctual telepathy, which is the telepathy of early man, Mm -hmm. something that we share with the animal community. There is mental telepathy, which is rationally based mind-to-mind telepathy. And then there's spiritual telepathy, which is that ability, that that ability to pull in pure intuitive information. And in addition um, to information from the soul, the soul is actually the portal to the higher worlds. When we make contact with the soul, we have the ability to access even higher worlds and information from the divine or universal mind where information on all subjects can be found. So how does this book relate to to your work with intuition? I just see it as a higher correspondence, the more advanced level. 
Mm -hmm. I had always been very touched and envious when reading about people who could communicate with the higher worlds. Joan of Arc, for example, talked to saints and angels. Eileen Caddy received the guidance that led to the Fintorn community in Scotland. And the botanist George Washington Carver walked in the woods each morning to talk to God. He called it the divine radio, so apparently God talked back. It's always stirred such a longing in me, and I've always wondered if it's only special people or people more evolved than most of us who can have these experiences. And by immersing myself in this topic, I realized that we can all do this, that with proper training, we all have the ability to access these higher worlds. So these higher worlds, does it matter about your religious philosophies that you follow? Does it matter about your race? Uh, are, are there any... Are there any let me see here. Is, is there anything that is humanistic that would hold you back from from this step? I don't think so. It, it really is a, a question of mind training mm -hmm. if we're willing to do the daily practice because it is a daily practice. We're building a bridge from our strictly human world into the superhuman or subtle worlds. It's an evolutionary step. We're moving from from human to superhuman development. What evidence do you have that that points to this that it's that it's something on a global basis and not just within a person's own belief system? Well, there's so many, so many um, stories of what we might call forerunners, people that who've gotten there before us, who've mm -hmm. had this experience. Mystic seers are great um, spiritual leaders. And it's also something that many creative artists talk about. Right. And I found this really fascinating, that how this relates to the experience we call genius. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite books was called Higher Creativity, and it was written by the late Willis Harmon, who was the former president of the Institute of Noetic Sciences. It was my, one of my all-time favorite books. And when I started this book, I went back and reread that. And I also looked at his original sources. And when I did, I found something very interesting. This book um, covered the biographies of artists, writers, composers, scientists, and inventors. And what he discovered is that the source of their greatest achievements was an intuitive breakthrough. And there were a lot of quotes, and some of these hmm. have become familiar. But when I read the full text of these interviews, what I discovered is that many of the people we call geniuses talked about their creative process in exactly the way it's explained in the wisdom teachings that it's through the soul that they had access to a universal flow of information and inspiration. In the late 1800s, a man named Arthur Abel, he was an American violinist living in Europe, interviewed Puccini, Brahms, Strauss, Wagner, and other composers about the source of their creative process. And it was very interesting because their, their stories were so consistent. Each of them spoke as, of the soul as a portal to a universal source of inspiration that once they connected to the soul, the ideas and images simply flowed into their brains. And I have many of the stories in the, in the book. And it became very interesting when I realized that genius is not a rare and random event. It's a, it's a quality. It's, a, it's an, um, something that we can all cultivate. It just takes this daily practice, this daily meditation practice, to create that connection between the human and the um, subtle world. What's the difference between meditation and prayer? Well, meditation is actually a step-by-step -step process where we train the mind. Mm -hmm. In prayer, we're really petitioning assistance. With meditation, we're actually training our mind. In this particular type of meditation, it's called creative meditation, we are training the mind to act as a conduit between the soul and the brain. Information has to reach the human brain for it to be part of our conscious awareness. So we're really like mental athletes. We're building up that bridge day by day. Is this um, information highway with us when we're born? And if so, why would we have to use meditation to find it again? Well, I think we all have the ability to do that, but mm -hmm. we're all human. And what we're doing is we're actually building a bridge to the superhuman realms. So this is really, as I said, an evolutionary step. It's not something we're born with the potential, but we actually have to do the work. Eventually, through the evolutionary process, everybody will be able to do this. Those of us who are choosing to do this work really are the pioneers who are leading the way to a new kind of human. What advances have you seen personally in, in you know, building this bridge? 
Well, I joined an esoteric school, and I started doing this every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I saw is that even in the early stages, I started to feel a connection to my soul. And I always thought that this was something for people who were more evolved than I am, that this is something that maybe would happen to me in future lifetimes. But I, and I was surprised that I felt a deepening connection to my soul. And even before the bridge is really built, mm -hmm. at the end of our meditation, we ask for soul light to flow down over our physical bodies. And you start to feel um, a lightning. You start to feel sort of a, a, a vibration where you're starting to realize that you're more of a spiritual being. And my heart started to open. I just feel a certain kind of joy that is not really related to physical events in my life. It's been something that's really changed my life. Could this be a psychosemantic reaction for... Uh, because someone who has had problems or someone who is seeking has actually just stumbled upon something within themselves and there is no bridge? I don't think so. I don't think so. We have so, so much testimony, as I said, from mm -hmm. our saints, sages, and um, spiritual leaders that there is a subtle world and that we can make contact. So how do you connect with your soul? Well, this is an interesting story because okay. it's a step-by-step -step process, and the first step is the refinement of our physical, mental, and emotional bodies. And this is very important because we need to create the direct line of communication between the soul, the mind, and the brain. And to do this, we have to purify the physical body and quiet the, minds and, quiet the mind and emotions. If we have an illness, if we're tired, if we have mental or emotional static, mm -hmm. it makes it hard for our brains to register the higher wisdom and ideas. It's like it repels, especially any kind of emotional upset will just repel the subtle currents of information. And what I discovered is that refinement practices are part of all spiritual traditions, from the noble eightfold path of the Buddha to the development of Christian virtues to the teachings on character refinement found in Judaism and Islam. Right that even though the methods vary from tradition to tradition, the requirements and goals are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Purity of body, control of the emotions, and stability of mind. And I had a lot of problems with this. When I really got serious about meditation and tried to quiet myself down, what I discovered is I had huge amounts of old um, mm -hmm. emotional issues um, bubbling up, and this is very common. And one of the big things that I needed to do was forgiveness work. And I had such a hard time with this that I started working with a, a spiritual healer. And he gave me three prescriptions, so to speak, three meditations that he mm -hmm. wanted me to do daily. One was on forgiveness, one right. was on compassion, and one was on loving kindness. And um, I started doing this, and through that process, I really started to quiet myself down, especially the forgiveness work was important to me. And um, when I started to quiet myself down, then I started to be able to make that connection with the higher world. Jack Cornfield has talked about this a lot. When he first started to teach meditation, he discovered that at least half of his students were unable to master even the basic concentration exercises. Hmm. And the reason was that they had so much emotional turmoil, so much unresolved stuff. And he's been very much a pioneer in bringing Western psychotherapy into Eastern contemplative practices and speaks about the need to really calm ourselves down emotionally. And that's really essential, and it's really made a difference in my life. Colleen, please stand by. I've got to take my break. Exonation, Colleen Morrow is our special guest. Her website is spiritualtelepathy.net. And uh, Colleen and I will be back on the other side of this short break set as we continue here in the Exon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. <laughs> In the world today, most people want what is called the American dream. They want love, a family, a fancy car, and a nice home in a nice neighborhood. They also want a good job and money to travel to interesting places. Life is great because they have the American dream. But what happens to this dream if they hear they have a devastating illness like lung cancer? The doctor may tell them they need treatment immediately or they will be dead in six months. He tells them, you need surgery, and then you need chemotherapy to get better. 
When they get home, they think of many unanswered questions. They ask themselves, Will I survive when so many of my friends with cancer have died? How will I deal with the pain, hair loss, nausea, and vomiting, sore mouth, and other side effects of chemotherapy and pain of surgery? Will I be able to keep on working? What will happen to my family? Then they look at the internet and wonder, Is there a better way to deal with lung cancer and return to my American dream? Carl Helvey can tell you, yes, there is a better way. Carl Helvey is a registered nurse with a doctorate in public health and a 38-year lung cancer survivor. Carl was given six months to live when diagnosed, and he refused chemotherapy and surgery. Carl used alternative interventions. Those not only helped him overcome lung cancer, but also to remain cancer-free and healthy for over the past 36 years since recovery. In his book, You Can Beat Cancer Using Alternative Integrative Interventions, Dr. Helvey will tell you his story of using all natural treatments for lung cancer and continuing to work during his treatment. Free of pain and discomfort, Carl will also share how he remained cancer and disease free since then without chronic illnesses or prescribed medications. His story is supplemented with chapters by Dr. Bernie Siegel, Dr. Francesco Contreras, and Dr. James Forsyth, alternative integrative physicians, and Dr. Kim Dalzell and Tanya Harder-Pierce, health professionals, all have successfully helped others overcome cancer. Research presented by the alternative physicians on their treatments for lung cancer demonstrate a significantly higher long-term survival rate for lung cancer clients than those obtained by conventional doctors. In addition, their clients were free of or had reduced side effects. You can beat lung cancer using alternative integrative interventions by Dr. Carl Helvey is now available at all major book outlets and at www.beatlungcancer.net. That's www.beatlungcancer.net. This information may help you return to the American dream. Manifestation is driven by imagination, intent, and passion. In our culture, all three have been distorted and disabled by modern media and exploitation. Re-engage your imagination and your passion by entering into the world of paranormal romance. Kahir O'Donnell takes her readers on an exciting journey into the endless possibilities of loving, passionate, and mutually respectful male-female relationship. Her latest book, The Long Dark Night, features special ops adventure, a daring rescue, a psychic woman from the stars, and a special agent that will die to protect her. The Long Dark Night by Kahira O'Donnell is now available at kahiraodonnell.com or amazon.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge, breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money in abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. Good real estate websites are not just about showing listings, but offering visitors valuable information about neighborhoods, market statistics, tips, and personal insights. Luckily, you will find that on Roost, but you won't on many other real estate websites in Budapest. That's why we created Roost. Roost is a website with tailored results for the foreign investor, curated by Hungarian-loving expats who found their home abroad and decided to roost in Budapest. Let Roost help you get started on the right foot. Whether you intend to live, work, 
play, retire, or simply invest abroad, Roost offers all types of properties in Budapest, from affordable studios to luxury homes. From neighborhood insights like where to grab a great coffee or how to buy property, our team of local experts can answer your questions and speak to the direct concerns of a foreign investor. Buying foreign property is an exciting and complex adventure. It can also be very time-consuming and costly if you don't have the best information and resources at hand. Roost provides professional real estate services and assistance to an international clientele of foreign property investors and rental apartment owners in Budapest. For more information on Roost, visit their website at www.roost.co. That's www.roost.co. My name is Michael Telstar, Canada's leading mentalist from Toronto, Ontario. Hi, my name is Splenza, and you're listening to my dad, Ron McConnell, on the Exxon. This is Psychic Dorothy from St. Catharines, and you're listening to Rob McConnell. Hello, my name is Holly Reeves, an astrologer from astro for You, and you're listening to Canada's number one paranormal radio show, The X Zone, with Rob McConnell. Welcome to The X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back, everyone. Just a bit of uh, housework here before we get back to our guest this hour, who is Colleen Morrow. She is the author of Spiritual Telepathy. Wednesday, September 30th, 8 p.m. until 10 p.m. Eastern, right here on the X-Zone radio show and live and around the world on the X-Zone broadcast network and Starcom radio network. We're going to have the debate of all debates when it comes to ufology. Stanton T. Friedman, who is the great-grandfather of ufology, after all, if it wasn't for Stanton T. uh, Friedman, nobody would have ever thought that the incident that allegedly happened in 1947 in Roswell, New Mexico, would still be alive today. Plus, without Stanton T. Friedman, what would the city of Roswell, New Mexico, really be? Anyway, he's going to be debating Michael Horn. Now, Michael is the North American representative for Billy Meyer, we're going to be de- they're going to be debating that very topic. Billy Meyer, Stanton T. Friedman doesn't buy it. He's going to be debating Michael Horn, who is an avid believer. That's on Wednesday, September thirtieth, right here on the X Zone Radio Show. Also, the X Chronicles newspaper is scheduled for distribution next Friday. That's a week from this Friday. It's going to be the summer doldrum uh, edition. Then we have September, where we always remember 9-11. October, our special Halloween edition. November, Remembrance Day. And then, of course, December. Well, what would December be without Christmas? That's coming up on the X Chronicles newspaper, and you can visit our ebook case where you can buy past editions of the X Chronicles newspaper at www.wikipublishinghouse.com. And yes, Wiki Publishing House is a division of Relmar McConnell Media Company. Colleen Morrow is our special guest. Great talking to you, uh, Colleen. I love the way you think, and it's so nice to talk to people who believe in their heart of hearts that we do have a better tomorrow, and here you are teaching us the way. Fantastic. Glad to be here. Um, I, I looked at the, briefly at the uh, table of contents of your book, and I was wondering if you could describe or what you mean by the universal human. The universal human really is the soul-aligned human. Barbara Marks Hubbard talks about this a lot. She says that we are the crossover generation, as she put it, that um, those of us on Earth today are responsible for leading the way from one stage of our species evolution to the next. And in studying the esoteric tradition, what I discovered was that we become universal in our outlook once we open the heart chakra, that the lower chakras really have to do with our personal earthbound existence. 
and the higher chakras have to do with our spiritual selves. And the heart is really the borderline between the, the human and the spiritual, between the physical and spiritual worlds. And when we open the heart, that's when we become universal in our mm -hmm. outlook. We draw closer to our souls, and we're able to feel our interconnection with everything and everyone. And that's a really significant step. And spiritual telepathy, our ability to build this bridge, really starts to happen when we start to move into those higher energies. So this is a, this is a, a, a life lesson process that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How long does it I mean, how long, I'm sorry, dear. It's something that's going to happen through the evolutionary process mm -hmm. to each and every one of us. But as I said before, we can speed up the process by doing this practice, right. by having a discipline. And those of us who do this really are the pioneers who are helping other people. We're blazing a trail that other people can follow. You say the soul is the kingdom of God. How do you, how do you, how do you explain that? Well, in the New Testament, um, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God. That's mm -hmm. the main focus of the New Testament. Yeah. And I grew up Catholic, so I was um, told that it was a after-death heaven where we could go and hang out with Jesus if we followed uh, church rules. And what I discovered by reading this esoteric information, and it's really the heart of all of our spiritual traditions, is that the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God really is a, is a state of consciousness. And that's what he was talking about. Not an after-death heaven, but the ability to reach beyond the human world into these superhuman worlds. And when we make the contact with the soul, that's when we've reached the kingdom of heaven, and that's what he came to teach us. And it's kind of gotten lost in church teachings, but when you read the esoteric Christian material, mm -hmm. it's really clear. I right. read the Gnostic Gospels, and I absolutely love them. No offense to be taken here, but how do you know that the that the information that you read was true and that what people within the religious communities where they think that once you die you go to heaven and you do hang out with Jesus? How do you you know, how do you know they're wrong and you're right? Well, before I started this book I thought mm -hmm. very carefully about how to present this material because it is esoteric. Yeah. And I thought a lot about how the science books on the extended mind were so popular, and yet the esoteric books that really provide the training of how we do this, how we expand our consciousness beyond the human world, have still have a very select audience. And I started seeing references to other traditions, which really intrigued me. And I studied this and discovered that this teaching really lies at the heart of all of our traditions, the teaching on the mind and how we train the mind to access the higher worlds. Jesus said in the New Testament, and I had never read the New Testament, Catholics don't. We're told that uh, the priest really can give us the information. We don't need to get it for ourselves. So I absolutely loved reading it. And um, he says very clearly that there's a teaching for what he called children mm -hmm. and a, a deeper teaching for people who are ready. And this deeper teaching is about the kingdom of God as a state of consciousness. All right. So who's right and who's wrong? I don't think there is a right and, and there is a right and there's wrong, who's wrong. I think it's just what people are ready for and what people choose to believe. But once again, but, are willing. but once again, how do you know that what you're saying is going to be coming and that we're going to be taking this evolutionary leap is real? Because it's because it's everywhere. Because it's in every one of our traditions. Because it really lies at the very heart of all of our traditions. But am I correct in saying that? the esoteric and new age community really didn't start until the advent of the internet? Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know. I mean, it was in the last century that this information started to be broadcast to the public, and it was Helena Bablatsky and mm -hmm. The Secret Doctrine, right. and Alice Bailey and her series of books, that really presented what had been a secret teaching to the general public. In the ancient world, this was taught in the mystery schools. And it was only a select few that were considered to be ready for this. And in the last century, it's come out more. It was, um, Alice Bailey really kicked off the New Age. She was the one who coined mm -hmm. that term. And a lot of what's happened since is kind of a superficial rendering of what she taught. What she taught was pretty hard to read and, and pretty serious. And I think that a lot of people are ready to go back and to take the time. It, it's really time-consuming to read this stuff and to assimilate it. As I said, I joined an esoteric school, and I spent quite a few years studying mm -hmm. this. 
and and um, using these meditation processes. You know, you, you said that people are starting to be ready to accept this. Is is it they're ready to accept it, or they can't find anything else that would fit their own beliefs that you know that something new is coming that meditation is the way that the traditional and accepted ways are no longer applicable is it is this is this the answer is this, is this the answer for the searching i don't know if we could say that they're ready to accept the information i think they're responding to a longing within their own souls that um, sort of leads them to do mm-hmm. the actual practices because it's the practices that really change us. It's nice to have the intellectual framework to understand, but it's really sitting down and doing the practices. That's what I found. I'd study this stuff for years, but until I got really mm-hmm. serious about doing the meditation practices, I didn't really understand and I didn't really have the kind of shifts that I've had in these last few years. Why would it take years to learn if this is something well, natural? Depends. Well, it depends on where you start. Again, I, don't, I would say that it's natural mm-hmm. over time, over the evolutionary process. Over millions of years, everybody will get there. But those of us who are doing it now are the pioneers. But We're what are taking you, the step. Okay, but what are you pioneering towards? We're pioneering to a new type of human, from the human to the superhuman. As I said, we're building that bridge from our strictly human world mm-hmm. to the subtle worlds of the soul. So we're making that leap from human to superhuman. And the only way we can experience this, you're not going to get it just by reading about it. If you read about it, you'll get inspired to do the actual practices. But until you do the practices, you won't really have the experience and you won't really understand. It really is an experiential process. So how does this, how would this change one's life? Well, it sure changed my life in the ways that I've um, talked about. Mm-hmm. Our souls are really our best source of guidance. They're the repository of our many lifetimes of experience. The soul knows our higher purpose. And many people have this longing to be of service, to really do their dharma, to do their higher purpose. And when we access the soul, we have a really clear source of guidance and a really clear understanding of the the task that we have. Each of us has some sort of task. And Mm -hmm. at this point, we're all needed. And I think people just respond to that calling of their souls. And the people that want to do this do do it. Would you say that this is almost a calling? I do. I do. And I think it's happening to many, many, many people. That, that people in this lifetime are responding to the call of their souls. Mm-hmm. They're doing these practices. They're getting in touch with the soul. And one of the first indications of soul um, contact is the desire to be of service. Because you understand then that we're part of a great universal life, the soul of humanity. And you lose your sense of separateness. And you, you move, as they say, from uh, me to we. You start thinking in more universal terms what you can do to be of service, how you can help other people. And there's really no bigger joy. But couldn't we just say that's part of being a human? That's, it's in each and every one of us? It is. It is. And most of us don't do it. Most of us are really preoccupied with our own individual lives. And, and when we start to access mm-hmm. the soul, we really start to make that shift. But isn't taking care of oneself and one's family and those that are within the community of that person, isn't that what we're supposed to do? Am I my, brother's, am I my brother's keeper? To some degree, yeah. As I said, um, when we access the soul, we realize that we're mm-hmm. all interconnected every, every, with everyone and everything, even the earth itself. And it's at that point that we want to be of greater service. Not to say that we neglect our mm-hmm. immediate family or our immediate community, but we're looking at ways that we can serve. And sometimes that is just in our immediate community. So what is going to happen with all the different religious dogma that's in the world today, and including you know the, the wars that are being conducted to this very day in the name of religion? How is this going to change? Well, I think that um, we'll shift from what's called the exoteric mm-hmm. or the outer form to the esoteric or inner form. And again, the inner form, the very core, is always the same. And so we'll start to lose that sense of difference and really start to respond to the the ways that we're all similar. But isn't this what religion has been trying to do over the years, is to get us to accomplish the same goal? I don't know. We all have our our sort of um, specific philosophy, and that's what keeps us apart. 
I mean, all the stuff with Islam is so crazy. It keeps us apart. But the, as I said, the very core, the very kernel is the same. And over time, the differences will start to wear away, and we'll see that. And it really is an evolutionary process that happens within us. Mm -hmm. And we really have to be willing and ready to do it. As I said, over time, it happens to everybody. But those of us who choose to undertake these disciplines can speed that process up. But how are those like yourself who are, who are speeding up the process, how are they helping mankind today? How are, you know, what differences are you making? I mean, besides your book, besides mm -hmm. going out and speaking, how, mm -hmm. how are you and the other people who are into this esoteric uh, mind frame, how are mm -hmm. they changing the world? Well, everybody that does it makes it easier for those who follow. Imagine that we're all cells in the body of God. And this is a kind of interesting um, visualization. If we're all cells and one of the cells starts to light up mm -hmm. and then another one lights up and another one lights up, it creates a magnetic pool that makes it easier for others to start to light up a, a dim light at first, but then lighter and brighter. We're leading the way and it will have an effect on everybody. Anyway, let me let me just think about this for a second. Mm -hmm. Once again, isn't that the exact same thing that religion has tried to get us to do? You know, uh, thou shalt not kill, honor thy mother and thy fa father and thy mother, um, and all the golden rules, no matter which philosophy it is. If mm -hmm. these religious philosophies over the hundreds and thousands of years have not been able to accomplish uh, nirvana, how is this esoteric way going to do that? Well, look at the world today, and you see mm -hmm. what the result is. It's just um, it's just words in outer form. Right. And like I said, you can sit down and you can read this esoteric stuff mm -hmm. and find it very interesting, but until you actually do the processes, until you actually make those deeper connections, you don't really live it. You don't really change in a fundamental way. And so what we have now is the outer form, and that's not enough. So how do you see it changing? Eastern, how do you see it changing? Well, little, little by little, as we settle ourselves down and sit down and do these practices. How many people There's would you no say so far are practicing these esoteric means? Oh, gosh, I don't know. Look at India and um, all the East. I mm -hmm. mean, they've been doing it for centuries. It's and, in the West. and look at the poverty they live in. Look at the shambles that they live in. Look at the filth they live in. You know, I don't want that. Mm -hmm. Do you? No, but they're no, but they're richer inside than we are. That doesn't pay they the bills, dear. Spiritualized culture. That doesn't pay well, the they bills. Have you know, true. they have a spiritualized culture. I would and rather they're sort of going at it backwards. Yeah. We're going at it from the material to the spiritual, and they're going at it from the spiritual to the material. So we'll all end up in the same. You know, and, and, and you know, esoteric. You know, in India and Pakistan are at each other's throat. They each have the nuclear capability now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know. They're not very good examples of what esoteric followings, uh, you know, are, are going to be an example of. Well, there's sort of a, a tide of evolution. I mean, there's always going to be, be people mm -hmm. who are sort of stuck in that lo those lower chakras, who are about war, who are about competition. Yeah. And then there's other people who have made that shift. And we need to get to a critical mass, and that's coming. It's coming, and I, I believe that Mother Nature is going to say, uh-uh, enough. I'm going to take control now. So mm -hmm. no matter if you believe in Krishna, whether you believe in God, whether you believe in Allah, when Mother Nature puts her foot down, it doesn't matter who you believe in. You're at her whim. You're at her mercy. And I think that, That's right. And I think that we're just literally destroying this planet because of greed, because of war, because we're stupid humans. Mm-hmm. Barbara Marks Hubbard and Eckhart Tolle talk about this. Mm -hmm. They talk about the fact that evolution happens as a result of some sort of crisis mm -hmm. that propels or forces us to make a leap forward. Right. And Tolle uses the example of an amphibian who's forced to develop the ability to live on land after its habitat dries up. Mm -hmm. Our own habitat is in trouble, and we're faced with the same need now. Our world is full of conflict. We have yeah. loose nukes floating around. Yep. We can easily extinguish the human race. So we're, our backs are against the wall, and we need to make a leap, not onto land, but into the subtle worlds, into that state of consciousness where we realize that we're all one, we're all in But when we look at what's happening today in the world, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example, the Iran nuclear deal. 
Look yeah. at what so many, you know, there's two sides. We want we want peace. We're willing to pay for peace. We're willing to shut our eyes in order to get a certain bit of uh, peace. We'll give you this, that, and the other thing. Then you've got a little country like Israel saying, hey, what the hell are you guys doing? Mm-hmm. So if we can't come to grips on a peace project like the Iran nuclear deal, whether you're for it or against it, it's a good try. Mm-hmm. You know, when will we ever be ready? I, I think that if push comes to shove, we're going to go over that cliff. I don't believe that anybody's going to be down below with a uh, with a safety net catching us. I think we're going mm-hmm. to be the result, you know, our demise of our own of our own makings. So it's how, possible. Yeah, it's so possible. How, we're pushed. Yeah, we're so, pushed right to the end. So how can the esoteric way and meditation help? And how do you get a person to meditate if they don't want to? Well, you have to be ready to do it. It's a discipline and it has yeah. to be done daily. And if you're not ready to do it, you're not ready to do it. It took me quite a while yes, to I, finally settle myself down. Hey, listen, I admire you. I, I truly do. You know, I, you. I, I hope that many of our listeners will will go to your website will buy your book because I, I believe that what you're saying makes a lot of sense. And that... Well, if they go to the website, they can mm-hmm. read the introduction to the book. Yeah. They can also see back issues of my magazine. Mm-hmm. And there's a way to directly order the book on Amazon through the website. You know, that's a great this thing. This deeply inspired me. Mm-hmm. This, this, and, I'm, I'm, and people are really going crazy over this book. Yeah. People that sit down and read it are very inspired. It's deeply inspiring and easy to read. You know what? I don't doubt that at all. I truly don't doubt it. But you know, being a journalist yourself, sometimes you have to ask the hard questions. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've been doing with you, asking the hard questions that the people out there don't have the, the, the pleasure of speaking to you like I have the pleasure of speaking to you tonight. So I'm trying to ballpark their questions. That's what, that's what this show is all about. Um, when do you see this shift happening? Are we? Let me ask you this: You, you were raised Catholic, mm-hmm. so right. do you believe that we are in the end times, the days that were talked about in the Book of Revelation? So, oh, wait a minute, that's in the New Testament, right? I don't know anymore. New Testament is, is the yeah. Book of Revelation right. is part of the New Testament. Yeah. So, I wouldn't. I wouldn't qualify it as end times. I don't no, I. That. I think that's nonsense. So why do you, why do you and here's one thing I discovered okay. that was very interesting, not having ever read the New Testament. Mm-hmm. But one thing I discovered is that the book of Revelations yeah. really is talking about this process of opening the higher chakras. The seven yep. seals are about the, the seven chakras. Chakras, that's right. And we, yeah, and I thought that was fascinating. Maybe other people didn't knew about it, but I didn't. Wow. So the seven seals are about opening one after the other. And when we get to the, the very mm-hmm. top, there is a new heaven and a new earth. You see, I agree that with you, except divine. I agree with you 100%. You know, for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, in the book of Genesis, it says, And God said, Let us create man in our image and our likeness. So therefore, if we are created in his image and his likeness, we ourselves are gods, number one. That's right. Number two, taking your seven chakras one step further, seven days of the week. On the seventh day, he rested the seventh chakra. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, the answers are right in front of us. We just have to read things with open minds, open hearts. And I think this is what your book points out. It, it is. And it was fascinating to me, having been Catholic, mm-hmm. to read the deeper meaning of some of these yeah. um, Bible verses, that it's right there. It mm-hmm. really is right there. And I started reading the sort of esoteric interpretations of the New Testament, and then I went back and read it again. And I was just absolutely fascinated by it. And if anybody that's interested in this that's listening... I would also really encourage them to read the Gnostic Gospels yeah. because it's actually more explicit there. And I was deeply touched and inspired by these Gospels. I, I urge my listeners to read as many so-called holy books as they can. And mm-hmm. I give the example that when I was a child, we lived in the multicultural part of Montreal. We went to school with our, with Jimmy Totina. We went to school with Eddie Chad. And the list goes on. Every nationality you could think of, that's what this neighborhood called Park Extension was comp- comprised of. All right, so here you go to school. You learn about the Italian traditions. You learn about the Hebrew traditions. You learn about the Indian traditions. You learn about the Irish traditions. And everybody learned 
about each other's culture, each other's uh, beliefs, each other's traditions. And I believe that this makes a person have a better understanding and the, the ability to respect others. And I believe that if we had more respect for each other as human beings, that this would be a better world. And I think that this is one of the main messages that you're trying to get across in your book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I agree. See, I do listen to you. <laughs> listen, um, our, our time is coming up very short. Um, I want to congratulate you on, on your book, Spiritual Telepathy. But you've got other books, don't you? No, actually, this is my first book. Oh, this I was is a your magazine f- publisher. That's right. That's yeah, right. I was a magazine yeah. publisher for most of my adult life, and this is my first book. Well, you've done a great job, from what I can see. Uh, I know that you've got a great publicist, Eileen uh, Dene. She is mm-hmm. a great lady. A lot of yeah, respect for her over the years. And what what is your final message that you would like to leave with the Exo Nation tonight? I mean, besides go to your website and buy your book, because I, I'm telling the Exo Nation buy the book. Mm-hmm. So what is, your, what, is, what is your message for the rest of the world tonight? My, my message is that um, the ability to access the higher world is mm-hmm. not just for the special people. Yeah. It's not just for shamans. It's not for saints. It's not for people like Joan of Arc. Mm-hmm. It's something that we can all experience. And it's simply a matter of sitting down and being serious about doing these practices. And we can be a great inspiration to the rest of the world. We can pull in really high-level information that can help many, many, many people help the evolutionary yeah. process, that we can be intermediaries between the physical and spiritual worlds, that we have this ability and that we can play a very important role in the unfoldment of what's happening today. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I'm looking forward to starting to build my bridge. Good for you. I am because... You won't regret it. It's a very deeply inspiring mm-hmm. thing that will change your life. As each and every member of the Exo Nation does, of which you're a member of, because you want to make a positive difference. And the reason we have this show, and we've had this show for 24 years, is we want to make a positive difference in just one life each and every night. And I can see that you're doing that by your book, and uh, congratulations on a job well done. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Please don't be a stranger. I look forward to the next time you and I meet here in the Exo. Thank you. You have a good night now. You too. All right. Bye bye now. Exo Nation, my guest this hour has been Colleen Morrow. www.spiritualtelepathy.net is her website. And once again, the name of her book is just like her website, Spiritual Telepathy. Go to her website. The links on purchasing the book are right there. Well, that's it for tonight, Exo Nation. I'll be back tomorrow night as once again we cross the time space continuum to this place that I call the Exo. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And as you all know, we're here Monday through Friday from 8 p.m. until midnight on the Exxon Broadcast Network and on the Starcom Radio Network. So until tomorrow night at 8 o'clock Eastern, for everyone here at the Exxon Radio Show, Relmar McConnell Media Company and the Starcom Radio Network, I am Rob McConnell. Always keep your eyes to the sky and your heart to the light. Good night, everyone. Closing time. Turn all of the lights on.